But if we had genuine diversity in other branches of the federal government, on state levels, and in our cities. To make this point more forcefully, here then are some stats, some statistics on women and African Americans, only two of the underrepresented communities. Here are stats on who is in Congress, who serves as governors and as mayors. In the 110th Congress here in this nation of ours, only 17% are women compared to 83% who are men. In the current Congress, only 8% of Congress members are African Americans. Among the currently serving governors, Women make up only 16%. African Americans make up only 4%. As of February 2008, in cities with populations of over 30,000, 15.7% are women and only 4% are African Americans. Hearing these statistics, and knowing that other underrepresented groups are in even smaller numbers in leadership roles in government, in the world of education, in not-for-profit social service organizations, in foundations, and in corporations. Knowing all of this, I offer this frequently used but nevertheless true statement. We have come a mighty long way, but oh, do we have a long distance to go. We've come a mighty long way on the journey toward an America where the words of the founding fathers would be honored. Now, we know there weren't any founding mothers there. <laughs> And we also know there were no people of color. But the words that were spoken were incredibly moving words. That all men, and we insist on saying, and women too, are created equal and have the right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Expanding on the language Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used in his most famous speech. We can certainly say that as Americans, we have yet to arrive at that day when all children, all men, and all women will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin, their gender, their religion, age, class, sexual orientation, physical ability, or disability. If we are to realize Dr. King's dream, which is your dream, and which is my dream, if we are to arrive at that point where in our nation, difference doesn't make any more difference then we must speed up the day when the issue of diversity and inclusion is everybody's business. I want to turn now to look briefly at where things stand in the corporate world in terms of diversity and inclusion. It would be rare to find a workplace where there is absolutely no diversity among the employees, particularly in terms of gender and age. But the question is, in this workplace or that workplace, where are the women folk? Are the sisters concentrated in what we used to call the secretarial pool? Where are the folk of color? Do they tend to be found far more in the male room than in the executive suites and the board room. Individual
individuals of the GLBT community, when found in the workplace, are they hesitant to bring their whole selves to work? And are there any accommodations made for people who are differently abled? The goal must be more than having a diverse workforce. The goal must be to also create an environment in the workplace that values all employees, that moves beyond tolerating diversity to respecting it, celebrating it, and using it in the interest of the company's business objectives. I like to put it this way. We need to move beyond counting heads to making sure that every head counts. Today, increasing numbers of American-based companies are focusing on attracting and retaining a diverse workforce and creating an inclusive environment where diverse people are respected, celebrated, and made to feel deeply a part of the enterprise. Now, you've got to ask why. Well, quite simply, because it is clear to the leaders in these companies that while there is a moral case for diversity and inclusion, there is also a compelling business case. It is the morally correct thing to do, to provide an equal opportunity for employment to qualified people of all cultures, backgrounds, orientations, circumstances, who wish to work in that company. But it is also the smart thing to do. As those of you here who are business women and business men know, the economic case for diversity and inclusion is a powerful one. First, in order for a company to compete in the global economy, it must move beyond the same old ideas for doing the same old things. With associates who come from different backgrounds and circumstances, there are inevitably different ideas, new ideas, from which the most innovative and profitable ones can be chosen. In short, Innovation is a necessity for successful competition in today's global economy. Business folk also know that their customers or clients want to see themselves reflected in the company from which they are buying goods and services. They want to see individuals from their communities in the boardroom, in the executive suites, among the suppliers and throughout the enterprise. Yet another reason that corporate leaders advance the case for diversity and inclusion is that they know that a work environment where everyone is respected and treated fairly encourages productivity. By contrast, a work environment where there is suspicion of or actual expressions of bigotry and discrimination sets up an unhealthy work environment that negatively affects productivity. Those of us in the academic world can learn some things from the corporate world in terms of how to successfully carry out our efforts around diversity and inclusion. As educators, I think we would do well to see that while there is a moral imperative for diversity and inclusion in the world of education, there is also an educational imperative and an economic imperative. In our educational system of K through 12, the baccalaureate and post-baccalaureate levels, there is a moral case for diversity in the composition of the faculty, among students and staff, and in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. 